But yeah. knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? Mm-hmm. And what would someone who is listening to this, what might they do differently? Yeah, I think that's that's huge and that's big because there, I mean, sadly, there are a lot of leaders in that. And, you know, in the situation there yeah. was, I knew something was off. I just didn't know what, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that, again, I would have quelled my distracted busyness and paid more attention to that little bit of inkling that I had that, you know, call it discernment, gut, whatever you want to call it. Um, because there were mechanisms I could have gone, you know, see, so I'm, I'm uh, executive director number two in the organization, so to speak. I could have had, tried to have a more uh, deliberate conversation with that senior leader. I don't know how fruitful that would have been because like I said earlier, we had had a few like places where we were sparring a little bit on some mm-hmm. things. So, um, but then my next step would have been to reach out to an elder or two and say, hey, you know, how are your conversations going? Here's I, mm-hmm. here's some things I'm discerning. I can't quite pinpoint anything specific. Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. I hope this next episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. That way you'll never miss a thing. Pastors, I know how hard it can be to keep your sermons feeling fresh and relevant and especially you're preaching week after week. So maybe you hit a writer's block or it's Friday and you haven't really finished things up. I wanna help. So I've got a 10 step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I simplified the whole prep process into a series of steps and reminders that can help you ensure your sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable. Super easy to use, 10 simple prompts with examples, and you can start using it as early as this Sunday. So visit preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description and you'll get a copy sent to you for free today. This episode is also presented by 10 by 10. Did you know that approximately 1 million young people in America drift from their faith every year? And this means that by 2034, 10 million young people will walk away from their faith and miss out on experiencing the abundant life that Jesus promised. Well, imagine if we could do something to reverse this. That's why 10 by 10 was born, a national initiative created to help make faith matter more to 10 million young people over the next 10 years. Together, we can turn the tide of young people walking away from their faith. So the question is, will you answer the call to help 10 by 10 advocate for the faith of the next generation? You can go to 1010 Dot org to learn more. That's 1010.org to learn more. And now to today's episode. Jenny, welcome back to the podcast. Carrie, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Well, we got to hang out in real life a couple of weeks ago. You came up here to Canada. We had dinner with a bunch of pastors in my backyard. Then you and your husband, me and my wife went for dinner the next day. You hung out with the Connexus team. It was really Super great to fun. see you in person. And I thought, it's time to catch up. Right. So, right. Um, Jenny, yeah, it is time to catch up. It's been too long. So you have worked with church leaders directly for over a decade. You've started off in the music business, then you transitioned to executive pastor at Crosspoint Menlo Church, and now you've been doing direct work with church leaders, largely in the area of culture, operations, strategy, sure. strategic planning, etc., for a decade. Based on what you see, what are some of the biggest challenges that church leaders are facing right now? Yeah, Carrie, it's so interesting because I think the the challenges I'm seeing now are more of where I, I find leaders a bit more tentative and mm. a little more um, still reactive. I think, you know, COVID put us into a posture of just having to react to the unexpected circumstances. And so I still sense a little like fearfulness and timidity in leaders of like, I don't know quite to, what to do, or I'm having a lot of leaders and, you know, and church leaders specifically saying, hey, I'm struggling to define the vision for the future. Of course we know the mission, right? But like, you know, how do I cast all those grand 2020 visions that we all had, right? Oh, and then it was yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, totally <laughs> explodes. And so I f- just feel a little tentativeness from leaders with that. Mm. And, uh, and so I think that's one of the things that I'm seeing pretty frequently. Now, I think enough leaders are getting frustrated with it, right? They're like, okay, enough of this. We need to get back to that visionary. Besides the fact, most leaders are visionaries. So we're like, we're hungry to be helping lead towards, you know, what we see on the horizon where God is leading us next. And so 
I think the opportunity I see is that move from reactive to proactive again, right? Like we're ready to like get more proactive about, okay, where are we going? Why are we going there? What's on the horizon? Um, you know, and to get away from that tentativeness or timidity that so many leaders are feeling. You know, you've raised a really good question, which is I've thought about vision too. And I do think it's inherently harder to see ahead right now. Do you find that with your own company? Like if you think about, okay, 2028, right. what's it going to be like? Like maybe the AI are going to run us. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I was going to say, I, I mean, part of why I think I'm so aware of this and and probably compassionate around this issue for leaders as I feel it myself in mm-hmm. that, you know, even trying to anticipate what's on the horizon for foresight over the next few years, you know, just even knowing like what to measure, what targets to set and, you know, and maybe because I don't like failure, which is probably, again, most leaders are like, yep, don't love failure. It's a necessary <laughs> part of gr- growth. And, but, uh, you, you know, it's like, I, I think setting some audacious goals or, you know, uh, uh, vision for the future feels a little bit like I, you feel like you're kind of shooting in the dark because again, I think we just have a kind of a fear reaction to the last few years. So yeah, for me, it's a, what, what to measure, what to really aim for. Um, and there's a little bit of, I'm trying to redefine what's most important to me, you know, like what, Mm. you know, I've been so ambitious for 20 plus years of my career and, what really does matter? What is most significant? And trying to get a little more honest with myself about that. That's a little bit of where I am, you know, personally in this season too. So do you have any early insight into that? <laughs> what is actually important to you and what might've been five years ago, but isn't anymore? Yeah, I think it is. It's just, it's getting back to healthy leaders and healthy teams has been a big driver for me for a long, long time. But it's really easy, especially, you know, in the seat that I'm in now where I'm leading a team that that's what we do. That's how we focus and support other organizations and leaders. It can quickly become about um, how do we make sure we've, you know, we're serving enough leaders or we're, you know, we've got enough, you know, organizations that we're partnering with that we can keep the doors open and, you know, just those functional things that are a part of, you know, running an organization. And I think for me, it's been a bit more of the, well, what's the real why behind that, right? Like, and can I keep that why more present than the metrics or the goals? The metrics and the goals matter because they help us, um, they help keep us motivated. But if they matter more than the true why, I think that's where it starts to get it starts to suck the life out of me anyway. That I think that's the thing for me is like, if I lose sight of, gosh, I want to celebrate the story of the leader that I was with last week who, um, you know, was really struggling with a dynamic with their team. And we were able to kind of coach through that and work through that. And they had kind of that aha light bulb moment where they're like, oh my gosh, here's what I need to do differently to lead our team better. And like connecting to those stories more than connecting to, just the the numbers and the metrics and so forth. So there's a, there's a lot of that of like, where am I placing my value and emphasis? And then you and you you and Tony and Marilyn and I were talking about this, but we're in a stage in season two where we're able to do more together. Um, and so when we're able to go do work together and my husband comes with me, I'm like, you know, again, we were up by you guys um, a week or so ago. And so we took a couple extra days and just played tourist and, you know, and so a, being able to merge more of personal life and work life, I've, I've historically always been pretty compartmentalized. And mm. I think a little more integration of work and family and my life being more integrated, I think is probably... I said a lot of words to get really get to that, to synthesize that. But I think like that, that integration more of my, of whole life is more meaningful to me right now. Yeah. You know, it's something that I've really been thinking about because I enjoy this work so much. There is no finish line ahead. Right. It's, it's, and so our mantra for the last few years, as we entered our fifties has been, we're taking our retirement as we go. 
Mm -hmm. So there's Mm -hmm. no like finish line where, okay, I'm done today. And now let's do a month in Europe or whatever. But, you know, we're getting on a plane tomorrow to go to Montana to see a friend who's getting married. We're going to spend a week there. We're spending a month in Australia, New Zealand, maybe Singapore and Germany next year. I'm doing some speaking, but we're also doing some really great travel, et cetera, particularly in New Zealand next year. And I think that's that's a sort of a new model. I mean, historically, there's always been a finish line, right? Yeah. Like, yep. when are you going to retire? And some careers still have that. I get it. And if you hate yep. your job, yeah, okay, right. I get that too. But I like my job. Like, I really enjoy it. And so yeah. how do I get permission to keep doing this? And then away we go. I'd like to go back to what you said earlier, or what we talked about briefly, which is how to cast a vision for the future when you can't see ahead and everything mm-hmm. is so so shifting and volatile and the pace of change is just exploding. Yes. So yep. this is what you do. You just spent a couple of days at Conexus walking yeah. Jeff and the team. I wasn't there because I'm the founding pastor, which means I don't have any responsibilities, um, but walking them through a three to five year plan or whatever you guys were doing. Sure. So if I come to you and I say, Jenny, I, I, just, I don't even know what 2024 is going to hold. Right. Like, yeah. Help me figure out. I got to, I got to put a plan together for the future. What do I do? Do I launch more campuses? Like we're growing, but like, yeah. what does that look like? What What are some questions you would ask me to help me see ahead? Yeah. It, you know, it, it, it is, it is a little daunting, I think for every leader to go, how in the world do we mark out? You know, it used to be, we did 10 year plans. Like, you know, that was just like what you did. And then we shortened it to five year plans. And now we're going, can we even do five years because of the rate of change and so forth? And so part of the way I like diffuse that a little bit is like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna try to look out on the horizon and see as much as we can see. So let's say, let's let's say we want to kind of aim for five years ahead. It doesn't mean we can't adjust the plan. So first of all, don't feel like you're locked in and like this is the only thing we can do because if something shifts or changed, we 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 adjust. But at least it mm-hmm. gets us, it get I think the the biggest challenge for most leaders is we stay in the immediate and we're not pushing ourselves to be thinking out ahead. I mean, one of the things I coach most leaders all the time is that you actually, and Carrie, like I need to be preaching to myself most of the time. So like, you know, (laughs) do as I say, not as I do. Right. But, um, but we really need, if you're in a senior leadership seat, the majority of your time should be spent like looking six to 18 months ahead. You know, so our church leaders who are listening, like, one of the biggest ahas for me when I was in the exec pastor seat was the day that my um, my team, it's Easter week, my team is like, you know, going crazy, you know, trying to make all the Easter stuff happen. And I'm not, my hair's not on fire. Because you know what? Back in November and December was when I was anticipating our Easter challenges and what that meant. And I was prepping the team and I was prepping our facilities. And I was like, so my busyness was six months ahead of, the team's busyness. And so that's always a little bit of a like uh, first question is where are you spending most of your time planning and thinking? Because you really need to be six, 12, 18 months ahead of the team most of the time. So that's a first question. Um, But then, you know, as we're really thinking big planning, it's okay, what, what has God consistently done here? Like, um, or where Great do we question. see momentum? Like, so we're looking for those little kind of breadcrumbs of um, what, whether you want to call it favor, success, momentum, whatever word you're comfortable with. But like, what are some of those things that God is doing in and through your team and your ministry? And then what does that tell us about the future? Because whatever, wherever we've seen, again, that momentum or favor, we want to kind of look at that and go, okay, what's behind that? And then how do we keep leaning into that for these next five years or whatever it might be? So those are some starting points for me. I'm looking at those, those breadcrumbs of history to say, what are, what are we best at? There's a, there's a scripture um, in Galatians um, that says, uh, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you've been given. And, you know, we take that personally a lot, but I like to look at it organizationally of make a careful exploration of who you are. Like, who, how has God wired you and gifted you even as a church? How has he uniquely like positioned you to serve your community? And then what would it look like to do more of that in the next five years? So those are some starting points, you know, for me in the conversation. Do you get a sense 
that leaders might be a little bit reticent to dream about the future because they've taken so many hits over the last five years. Yes. You know, all of our 2020 visions went up to smoke. Yeah. Um, We're a little shy because we said something and we got assassinated and then we said it the other way and then people got mad at us. And, you know, I'm still running into, there's a small subset of the church where there seems to be rapid growth and there's momentum. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of leaders who are still struggling and can't see the future. Do you see that? And if so, what would you say to those leaders? Mm. Yeah, I do see that. Um, and and I do understand it. It's, there's just fatigue, right? There's just a little bit of, gosh, how do I win? And, you know, we all want to feel like we're winning, right? Like that, the work we're doing is meaningful. It's making an impact, et cetera. And I think what I would say to those leaders is to, to pause and pay attention to the stories of um, a question I ask myself all the time is what's good, right? Because there's always something good. There's always something that um, that I often overlook because I'm fixated on the frustration or, you know, the thing that's not going well. And so I would just encourage those leaders that you're there and you're in that seat because you are strategically positioned to help lead that organization, that church, that ministry forward. That, you know, you're in that seat, not on accident. There's a reason you're there. And, mm. and, and our job is to go first. Our job is to help define what's next and, um, and to just give, your, give yourself, your heart, some space to dream um, and to try to reconnect with that. And you might have to figure out, what do I need to do that well? One of the things we talk about all the time is lead yourself well to lead others better. That's a little axiom that, you know, mm. I just kind of live with is, what do I need to do to lead myself well? Like if I'm not feeling a vision and hope for the future, well, it's really hard for me to lead others there. So I got to figure out how do I need to reconnect, to rejuvenate? What do I need to lead myself well so that I am I am in a place where I can help bring vision and direction to the team? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to say too, too much, but we just went through a situation where my wife and I were dealing with a really difficult situation for the last year or so. And that has lifted over the last month. Mm. And what I didn't realize is how much that was impacting my day to day. Yeah. Like when yeah, that yeah. lifted and that resolved, I'm like, you know, I've I've taught people for years. It's like, yeah, you know, if you're having a few challenges in your personal life, that's going to show up in your work life. But we were able to deal with this and it's like the veil got lifted. I couldn't believe it. And I think that's one of those things as well. What would you say the toughest challenge is that you have faced over mm. the last few years just as a leader yourself, Jenny? Yeah, I think that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I mean, I think it's kind of in the same vein of, but honestly, Carrie, it's probably been pushing myself too hard because of feeling the responsibility. So I, it's a blessing and a curse. I hold the responsibility of leadership very, uh, I carry the weight of that very, very, very much. Like I just like, I think, you know, my conviction around leadership is that it's sacred work because we are influencing people. And that means we're, we have the power to change or affect the lives of others. And so there's a true sacredness to the responsibility of leadership. So I hold that really rather heavy. And then in like strengths finder, I'm a responsibility person, you know? So it's like, you just kind of throw all of that on three, right? Did I remember that right? Yeah. Yeah, You remember that right. Yeah. So I like, I will just feel like I'm responsible for everything. And I think, you know, I, I felt very fortunate especially over the past couple of years that I was in a place where I could offer a lot of support and coaching and just hope to leaders, like the leaders that I got to work with. Like I felt like what a gift to be able to speak into leaders from the seat that I sit in, right? Because I wasn't in in the middle of trying to figure out all the church dynamics. I could sit kind of adjacent and bring perspective. And I can't tell you the number of times where leaders would think that it was only them or only their church that was navigating all of these challenges. And I would be able to just bring a couple stories and they'd be like, oh my gosh, like I, 
like I was convinced that it was just us. And I was like, no, it's not just you. Like, you know, so anyway, I, I sat in a very, I think, unique space to be able to speak into the lives of leaders. But I think I underestimated the emotional weight and drain on myself, right? Like in that I was trying to pour out and serve and support. And I think it caught up with me probably late last year. Like I started to really feel like the, gosh, where's my heart? Where's my motivation? Where's my passion? Like, I, I know I love this work. It's not a, I want to want to wake, I, I want to walk away from it, but it's like, I, am I doing it in a way that's sustainable? You know, and I'm sure mm-hmm. I probably should have been picking up and rereading a lot of your resources to help help well, I, coach I have to me, re-read right? Them too. Okay. <laughs> so, but th- but that yeah. that that is what it was for me is that I I I I, I violated my own boundaries and limits around being available and knowing what rejuvenates me and. Um, and being more purposeful and disciplined in that. And I really was convicted by some of the very things we say at Foresight, lead yourself well to lead others better. Self-leadership is a core conviction and value of ours. And I just had to get a real honest with my team and say, every boundary we had around my schedule, I was blowing up, right? Because I felt like I needed to do this or to respond to this or be present for this. And I know every leader understands, especially pastors, like we, you they live in that world too of just feeling responsible. So how did you navigate out of that? Or maybe you're not out of that. I would, I would say I'm not completely out of it if I'm real honest Mm. in, uh, you know, we were on a call on Monday. Now the, I I would say the thing that's been helpful is I brought my team more into it. So I have a small team, but they're a really phenomenal team. And, um, and you know, there's, there's occasions as a leader where you feel like, uh, gosh, I don't want them to, you know, think I don't have it together or I feel like I'm supposed to be the one, you know, like that, you know, that that isn't struggling with some of these things. And I brought my team into it and I said, guys, I don't think I'm giving my best or I'm not giving my best energy to the best things for us. Um, and here's why. And here's what's happening in my schedule. And here's why this drains me. And some of it is, and you talk about this, Carrie, too, but it's like my... I'm an introvert by nature. Now I have a mm. very extroverted job. Now I'm not an extreme introvert, but I like I I rejuvenate on alone time. I need mm. I need space to think, to write, to journal, to process, to read. Like, and when my schedule is back to back every day with people that need something from me. Right. And again, because I'm doing mostly coaching and consulting these days, like when I show up, I'm usually leading the room. So, the, and this is true for a lot of the, listen, the leaders listening, right? When you show up, you're often the one who has to lead the discussion or, you know, lead the meeting or whatever it is. And I just recognized I had way too much of that and not enough space that was rejuvenating and not enough conversations that were, were pouring back into me. So I let the team in on that. And part of our weekly staff meeting is, Jenny, how's your schedule look this week? Now I have an assistant who's helping me with that daily and she's like really disciplined about where we book things and where we don't book things. But then the whole team is looking at the decisions I'm making and what I'm committing to. And they're speaking into that. Um, And then they're also just looking at the calendar going, Mm, should you really be doing that? Like they, they have permission to ask that question. And then of course my husband's part of those discussions as well. But it's, it's, a, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a stretch for me, Carrie. Like I'm still figuring out how to right size my pace. That's healthy for me, healthy for the team and for the long haul. Well, I just said to my team recently, I need to go and reread at your best. Um, because 2023 has been, that's my last book, if any, yeah. you know, uh, but you know, all about time, energy, and priorities. And, yes. you know, one of the questions, and I'd like to ask you this, and you've hinted at it already, responsibility, Enneagram 3, you carry it all. Do you know how you let yourself get into that space? Because I don't think leaders wake up and go, all right, I'm going to overwhelm myself. I'm going to, <laughs> we slide into it and it's mm-hmm. incremental. Mm-hmm. And I'm very interested in my own life, and I don't know that I have an answer. 
What needs to be true in my life to allow myself to get overwhelmed? What, mm. what, what needs to be true in my life to cheat my own rules? Because I know the rules, right? Right. right. And yep. I can say, well, these are all A-list opportunities. And they are. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying no to some of them. But like, okay, but what has to be true to allow me to think I can bite off more than I can chew and still eat it? Do yeah. you have any insight into how you got yourself into that season? I The first word that comes to mind, Carrie, is scarcity. Mm. And that's a, like... That's a thing that I ha- I battle with a lot of like the fear mm. of mm. if I don't respond now, I might never have the opportunity. Or right. if I don't serve this church right now when they really feel like they need the support, that they won't get what they need. Or, and like, there's probably like unhealthy, like ego or um, hero, like, you know, mentality behind some of that too, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a little bit, if I don't, who will or when will it happen? And so I have to be, is it, it, let me frame it this way a little bit. One of my um, prayers this year in just kind of trying to wrestle through this with God is, you know, whenever I'm feeling that overwhelm, I feel like he constantly says to me, do you trust me? Like, seriously? I've been having like, those prayers lately. <laughs> Like, I mean, every time. And so, and this is real practical, right? But it's the, you and I both, we've had this conversation before. I have a whole team of staff now that I'm responsible for. And so if we don't book certain work or I don't take that consulting opportunity or I don't take that speaking event and we don't have that revenue to the bottom line. So this is just getting real raw and honest, right? But like, if I don't do these things, it might result in I don't have the resources to compensate my team or mm-hmm. I don't have the resources to bring home for my family, you know, and my contribution mm-hmm. to our family. And so that's that's where that scarcity word comes in is that I will fear there's not enough. And, you know, whether that's time or that's money or, you know, whatever that is, I will fear there's not enough. And so I react out of that fear. Um so I don't know if I got to your question no, exactly, but that's what came to mind as you asked. And helpful. Do you know where that scarcity comes from? I do. I've had I've had some good counseling through the years. You know, uh-huh. um, I grew up in a pretty, um, uh, you know, I would say we were low middle class, if not, you know, like you know, pretty pretty limited resources in my growing up years. So I know that's part of it. And some of that instilled some really good things of, you know, I, I will maximize things to the hilt. Like I will, you know, I, I will um, be as wise as I possibly can with my resources. And I'm pretty frugal when it comes to, you know, so there's some things that I feel like just made me conscientious of that. But I think it also made me feel like um, I, I just knowing and understanding the abundance of who God is. And, and here's the kicker for me, Carrie, is this, and this is, goes back to the question I feel like God keeps challenging me with, is do I really trust that he's my provider or do I think that I am? Because mm-hmm. I am firstborn, a type, overachiever, who um, feels a high sense of responsibility and had to be pretty independent and pretty capable pretty early in my life story. And so... If I'm real honest, I think it's up to me. Like, I think I am wholly responsible and it all is up to me. And if I don't do it, who will? And I think the the journey that I'm on with God right now is like, do I really trust him? Like, do I trust that he's actually my provider? Do I trust that he actually um, is directing our steps? And um, that's, the, that's the constant wrestle for me is am I doing it in my own power Or am I really leaning into God's strength? That's one of the major tensions in Christian leadership. Another one, I don't know whether you struggle with this sometimes, but I realize one of the questions that lurks in the back of my mind and why I might be tempted to do a little bit more than I should is, and I've had this for years now, it's like, well, what if this is the peak? What What if next year isn't as good as this year? What if 
what if this is the last opportunity? I don't know where that comes from, but do you ever struggle with that or that isn't your particular brand of poison? Yeah, a little bit of that. Yeah. Of, yeah. yeah like, and even now this stage of, well, gosh, I'm not the youngest one anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, for years I would be the youngest one at the table. And the young leader, the bright rising star, the whole deal. And you're still yep. young, Jenny. But yeah, I know what you mean. Thank you. But yeah, isn't that interesting? And it's like, Uh and so I'm even challenged by, Carrie, you've modeled this well, that um, the passing the baton or, and, or bringing in young leaders early enough. I think one of the things I see so much is leaders holding on too long and not bringing up and developing young leaders and bringing them with them. It doesn't mean just like passing it off and abandoning them. But I think like, in a lot of ways, I'm seeing a lot of leaders hold on a little too long and and not developing up others. And in some ways, I feel like I'm just getting started, you know, here in my late 40s. And yet I need to be conscientious of, hey, who am I developing? Who am I bringing up? How am I supporting them? And, um, and so I think I'm afraid of missing the right opportunities and the right moments because And it's kind of ridiculous, right? Because there are um, so many examples of leaders well into their 60s, 70s, 80s that are, I mean, living out their legacy in a beautiful way. And there is plenty for them to do. And there are plenty of ways for them to contribute. Um, I think it is all about with perspective. And so, I don't know, that's a few things I'm kind of conscious of right now. No, I think those are really good because, you know, one of the reasons I'm glad we're having this conversation before I move on, is there anything else? Is there anything else sort of in the the challenge or the season mm-hmm. that you haven't said that you would like to say? No, I think that probably, I think that probably c- gets it of just the, yeah. just real honesty about um, where am I and how do I need to be contributing at a meaningful level? And where is that, um, where's my perspective on all of that? Because right here are the building blocks for a toxic culture. If you and I are not having these conversations, if you aren't doing that level of examine, to use yeah. that phrase, or going yeah. to see the counselor or the therapist, or having those conversations with your team, that's where things start to go toxic. And yeah. it could be a little bit toxic, you know, a little bit of arsenic in the water. Uh, could still kill you, but a little bit, or it can go totally toxic. And I want to reflect before we get into your work on healthy cultures. You've been part of a church where you honestly thought the culture was healthy, uh, but there were things going on with the senior pastor at that time that you didn't know about, other people didn't know about, and it all came out, made headline news for a while. It's a very common story. Yeah. Any reflections now, years later, about how that happens, because I get Mm -hmm. DMs and I'm sure you get more of them from people who are like, we're in a really unhealthy culture here. Or alternatively, I thought it was healthy, but it turns out leader X is doing Y. And we had no idea. So any observations from that season in your life with a little bit of time and extra wisdom now that you've got some distance from them? Yeah, and I would say that has the distance, the time has been helpful because there's a little bit of, Mm -hmm. as I reflect on that season, like and initially when things came out um, and I had moved on by that point, but um, it was just so heartbreaking to recognize that there were things that were unhealthy and I didn't have good discernment around it. If I'm, you know, like I think... um, I reflect on that a little bit, Carrie, in that it's kind of that proverbial frog in the boiling pot of water, right? Like, you know, you're the the temperature's rising and you're immune to it or you're you're not, you know, you're you're just in it so you don't recognize that it's shifting, it's changing, the water's about to boil. And I think that was very much true. I mean, there I've had to wrestle over the hand last handful of years of like it, not to throw the whole thing out. Like I kind of wanted to like think, you know, gosh, did I just miss it from day one? And, mm. but I think really what happened was the pressure of um, growth and momentum over time created fractures, right? 
and particularly mm. for that senior leader. But, um, you know, one of the things when I'm working with teams on culture, we talk about there's three critical parts of every organization, a clear purpose, a strong culture, and a good strategy. But we typically focus on the first and the third. We focus on that purpose, that why. What's the vision? What's the mission? Like, what are we doing? And then we jump to strategy. How are we going to make it happen? You know, and so it's like, and we get really excited on that. But the culture, the people are really the linchpin that tie those two things together. And the pressure of the strategy, especially when you're experiencing significant growth and momentum, um, the pressure of that creates fractures in the culture. And as I reflect back on it, I, when I left, um, and I left a couple of years before it uh, kind of imploded, I knew there was something off, but I couldn't name it. Mm. And, uh, you know, there were just a few things that weren't quite right, um, but it was more of a Can you give us an example? Feel. Like, what, what did you sense was off? What, what was going off in your spidey senses? Yeah, there... I, there was a, a bit more tension between me and that senior leader. Um, things that we historically had been aligned around, we were not seeing eye to eye anymore. And, um, and, and I, you know, again, I was like, well, they're the senior leader, you know, I, I, you know, so it was like, what do I do with that? Because we're not quite, we're not quite seeing it the same way. Um, so there, there were some things there. There were some, I want to say, ta- wanting to take shortcuts. Um, mm. You know, some kind of like, not like grossly wrong, but just like, just integrity drifts that didn't feel quite right. Um, but I couldn't what say this is- What would an example of is, a shortcut be? Just so so we can get specific. Yeah, it would have been, it would, it would, it would have been, um, so in this particular case, we had uh, a number of staff, not just the lead pastor, but a number of staff who, including myself, who had, um, some extracurricular projects, whether it be mm-hmm. speaking or book writing, et cetera, which is not uncommon. And initially we had some pretty clear boundaries around how we did those arrangements and protecting, you know, making sure that the resources that the church was using for things was, um, was not being spent on people's side hustles, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so there were just some shifts in that of wanting to take different approaches, um, you know, in that area. And and I, I wasn't completely comfortable with it personally, but it was a, uh, it was, you know, again, just kind of subtle. It was gray. It wasn't it was black gray. and white. It was a little bit gray. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Sure, fair enough. Um, and then I will say another piece of the puzzle there was um, some adjustments and drift over time around accountability. And Carrie, I would say this is probably one of the biggies, right? Yeah. In that we had a good structure for like our elder board and the accountability process. Mm-hmm. But over time, it was becoming more of a rubber stamp than it was becoming a true accountability uh, system. And again, very like very little moves over time that ultimately led to there not being probably the healthy accountability structure that um that it should have been there. Hmm. Hmm. Um so yeah, those are those are a few things. You know, we're trying to be just um I would say one of the things that um kind of stands out to me in that season was I think we got too distracted and too busy to have good discernment. And, mm-hmm. and I would say that about myself. So, so like, I'll give you a little context. We were um, one of the fastest growing churches in the country at the time. I was executive director. I was number two in the organization. Um, one particular season, I was building out a brand new facility while launching another campus and I was incredibly busy. Like I had so much going on that I was juggling so many different things that I think I didn't have the margin for discernment around. And it wasn't completely my responsibility. So I also recognize that, you know, yeah. but, um, but I think, I think we're, when we're too busy and too distracted, it can keep us from having a good 
um, awareness on the health of the leader, the health of the team. And I think in hindsight, that really stands out to me that I thought I was doing all of this really good stuff for the, the future of the church and the, you know, the strategy we were trying to accomplish. And it distracted me from maybe some other parts of my responsibility as a leader that um, I just didn't have margin for or was not prioritizing because of the distraction. Does that make sense? I think this is, oh, it makes a lot of sense. And I think it's so helpful because, you know, when you finally see a headline and there was a headline at this church that we're describing and there were some moral indiscretions on the part of the senior leader, et cetera, et cetera, just a, a very common story. Yeah. But one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation is it's not like, sometimes you can look at that and say, Everybody knew and they were hiding and protecting and all that stuff. But I don't think that's the case. A lot. That does happen. Yeah. But I yeah. think it's more common that you have, you know, not that your heart is completely pure. I've known you for a long time, but you have a good heart, Jenny. Like you're not out trying to, you know, pull the wool over people's eyes or right. doing things behind the scenes that are not consistent with um, who you present yourself to be in public. At least that's never been my experience mm -hmm. of you. So you have good hearted staff working yeah. really hard. Yeah, And they're like, yeah, something smells a little bit off, but I don't really know. And you just keep going and you're busy. And the next thing you know, there's yeah. this revelation. So for people who are in that situation or leaders who wonder if they themselves are drifting into unhealthy territory, what are some subtle signs that your culture might be turning toxic? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think the, I think the busyness piece is big. Um, and, and here's the thing, you know, because then I, I've, I've seen other organizations kind of react to that and then be like, oh, we, you know, like we can't be busy at all. Well, there are certainly busy seasons, but busy, a busy culture without rhythms of renewal is a caution mm. flag to me, right? Like, cause I, mm. you're going to have busy seasons. We're going to have the big building project or Christmas or Easter, or, you know, some big initiative that you have going on. But if we have just a busy culture without rhythms of renewal, you know, that those, then, then that is a warning sign to me. Like that's a caution flag to me. Um, I think also seeing siloed or very disconnected teams where people kind of start creating boundaries, even between teams or, you know, between projects where it's like, we lose the like, we're all in this together. Like when we lose that, what you know, there could be other things impacting that, but a lot of times it's like a, I'm going to work hard to protect my little team or my space so that we don't get caught up in the fray. And I mean, kudos to that leader if they're noticing something. And But I think if you're the senior leader and you see, you know, people kind of um, getting siloed or disconnected from one another, there's usually something going on in the culture that's causing that. Um hmm. Sometimes it's a little bit of a byproduct of just fast growth and trying to divide and conquer and make all things happen. But oftentimes a very siloed or disconnected or some us versus them language is often a symptom of, okay, there's something a little off. Um, high turnover, that's a biggie. Like mm -hmm. if you're cycling through people, there's a reason you're cycling through people. And there's, even if it's like, there's not uh, I don't, you know, there's a lot of things that impact healthy cultures, but if you're, if you're cycling through people and people aren't staying, there's a reason why that's happening. Um, and then I go back to that accountability structure. Um, you know, the challenge with that is that we're only ever as accountable as we really want to be. Like we can, we can put in the systems and we can play the game, but we still have to like be willing to be accountable. And if there are not, um, mechanisms for that. Um, and there are checks and balances around that. And we kind of understand how that structure works. Um, that's always a, that one's a concern to me. Another thing that stands out to me is um, uh, posture of learning and being in community. So mm -hmm. when I think in hindsight too, about some of where we were in that season, um, some of our most senior leaders were not in community with other peers and other leaders. Um, they were pretty isolated. And that was true of that lead pastor. And um, and so if we're, I think 
finding community with other peers who understand your world and are asking good and hard questions and are speaking into your life, if that's missing, um, I think that is a little bit of a warning sign. Those are really good signs. And again, you know, having that happen doesn't mean there's some kind of moral failure in the background. No. It just means your culture is not going to be ideal, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, because there's... Um, yeah, that doesn't mean that it goes that direction, that it has to go to moral failure or implosion of the leader. But all of those things mean something's a little adrift. Something's not quite as healthy as it could be for the longevity of every person on the team. You know, I mean, one of my deep convictions about why healthy culture is so important is it's, it really is the stewardship of people in pursuit of a mission, right? Like we have this team of people who are assembled to help us achieve this God-given mission. And so our job, especially as senior leaders, is to steward this group of people, to steward this culture in such a way that really this is like the best place to work. This is the place where I'm being at like, um, I am growing, I am learning, I am, I, you know, I am being challenged spiritually, professionally, you know, like in, in healthy ways to keep growing and being the best that God has equipped me to be. And I think, um, you know, when you start to see some of these symptoms of an unhealthy culture or a toxic culture, um, taking some action to, uh, move towards health, I think is really, really critical. Obviously that goes without saying, but. Can a church be healthy if the leader isn't healthy, the senior leader? Oh, that's a good question. I, you know, I think about um, some of my experiences and I think that not entirely, I guess is the short answer to that. Mm, yeah. um, if I think back to that particular scenario, I think pockets were healthy. And I think there were places where the team was a bit insulated from some of the unhealth of senior leadership. But in the end, it was catastrophic for every person who was on that team. Right? Like, and in some ways, I think because I had such a heart and I did not do this perfectly. So I don't want to, I don't want to mislead this. I had such a heart for that team to thrive, even though like in the, the latter years I was there, I knew that something was a bit off. I had such a heart for that team to thrive that I was really committed to kind of being the buffer mm. and protecting the team but in some ways that um, almost made it worse in that, again, then I moved on and so created that chasm. Um, and so uh, the, the answer is no, I don't think so. Ultimately, it's going to trickle down. It's just a matter of when, right? So goes the yeah. leader, so goes the team. Yeah, that's what I think. I think you, you, you can temporarily have a bad season, yeah. but inevitably the healthy people will leave. Yes. Yep. Because they'll smell it like you smelt it. Even if they don't know what's going on, they'll smell it. They'll trickle out and you'll be yep. left with people who are at the emotional health or spiritual health of the senior leader. Yeah. If you're going back in time or you found yourself in that situation in the future, what would you do differently now? Because I'm Ooh, thinking about the big. people who are listening who are in that situation mm -hmm. right now. They're like, Jenny... Uh, yeah, that's us right now. Yeah. And you kind of like, oh, gave everyone the benefit of the doubt. And, mm -hmm. and I, I don't think culpably, like you didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. And you yeah, moved on and you had a new calling and away you went. But yeah. knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? Mm -hmm. And what would someone who is listening to this, what might they do differently? Yeah, I think that's, that's huge. And that's big because there, I mean, Sadly, there are a lot of leaders in that. And, you know, in the situation there yeah. was, I knew something was off. I just didn't know what, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, again, I would have quelled my distracted busyness and paid more attention to that little bit of inkling that I had that, you know, call it discernment, got whatever you want to call it. Um, 
because there were mechanisms I could have gone, you know, see, so I'm, I'm, uh, executive director number two in the organization, so to speak. I could have had tried to have a more uh, deliberate conversation with that senior leader. I don't know how fruitful that would have been because, like I said earlier, we had had a few like places where we were sparring a little bit on some mm-hmm. things. So, um, but then my next step would have been to reach out to an elder or two and say, "Hey, you know, how are your conversations going? Here's I mm-hmm. here's some things I'm discerning. I can't quite pinpoint anything specific." But, you know, well, you know, maybe a little bit of, you know, extra support or like checking in on our leader and our team. Uh, I think at least reaching out and having that conversation um, would be valuable. Now, the danger in that, and I'm, I'm sure leaders that are listening to this are going, yes, and that could mean I put my my job in jeopardy, right? Yep. Because um, a lot of leaders, when they're not in a healthy place, also... Um, will not be very forgiving if we go around them to um, whomever they're accountable to in our structure, it was the elders. Uh, so, I mean, I think, you know, the Matthew 18 thing would be to go first to that leader and just try to prod and ask some questions and, you know, posture around that is going to be important, et cetera. And then if that's not terribly fruitful and you're still feeling like, you know, something's not quite right that I think we need to be paying attention to, um, going to like an elder board or somebody who does have that authority and just opening the conversation a bit, you know, Mm -hmm. another, another thing to do would be to say, Hey, I'm sensing that thing, you know, that, you know, we're not doing great as a team. Something's a little bit off. And, um, what, what probably would have happened in our scenario would have been the leader would have been like, yeah, I think you're just making that up, you know? And, Um, but, but maybe suggesting, well, Hey, it wouldn't hurt if we did a survey of the whole staff just to see, you know, am I just reading something or is the whole staff feeling something, you know? And like, so I'm a big, I'm a big advocate of, Hey, we need to have a pulse from the team on a regular basis and trying to just get more understanding of what the team is experiencing at all levels. And, uh, so I think a little bit of just trying to dig in and get a little more, insight you're not on a witch hunt but on a hey what is my gut like congruent with what others are experiencing or am you know and and how do I start testing for that but I think you've got to follow your authority structure and um try to operate within that and you know maybe it's like like even in our case I, I guess I would say I I, I, Carrie, it's hard for me to know now, did I, I knew something was off in the culture, you know, cause knowing what I know now, I know that the leader was not in a healthy place. Um, no. I, if I'm honest, I kind, I think I felt like my leader was just distracted and lacking some vision. Um, and, and maybe that would have been even the best way to start the conversation, right. Of like, you know, Hey, I'm noticing this about you. How are you doing? Are you talking with the elders? Are you, you know, do you have good accountability? Like, could I have asked a few more questions that were not me trying to identify something they were doing wrong, but more of a, hey, I feel you feel a bit disconnected, you know? So I it I mean it's Yeah. It No, it's super and I love the nuance on this. Go ahead and finish your thought cuz I don't want to cut you off. No, I I think I I just kind of wrestling through it in real time because it's like, I know, I'm, I'm trying to th- envision the person who's in this situation, like we're describing, who doesn't know exactly what's going on, but knows something is off and saying, hey, what are those right conversations? And I really honestly, right? It's like, go, it, it's, a, it's a probably a get on your face before God saying, God, what do I need to do with this, right? Like how, instead of avoiding it or ignoring it and hoping it goes away, try to really get some good clarity on what's the right step to take to that would could lead towards health or at least some clarity around is our leader just tired and they need some support and w- could a few key questions from me asked in a uh, honoring but sincere and helpful way prod them to be brave enough to take some next steps that would avoid you know them going a super unhealthy direction. 
Well, and I appreciate the nuance in what you had to say too, because, you know, in this particular case, there was something, but a lot of the time there isn't. Your leader's tired. Maybe things aren't yeah. going particularly well at home. Maybe they're just in a slump, whatever. It's not always that there's something behind the scenes that is hidden, you you, yeah. you know? And, and so if you go in there with all guns blazing and like, <laughs> oh, this is a toxic culture and I'm getting rid of you and uh, whoa, 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 you're, what, you're, yeah. you're doing more damage than good right now. Yeah, I think that's what I'm afraid of is, right? There's such a nuance to this. And I, yeah. I, I think one of the things we talk about a lot in leadership coaching is that leaders were always in a bit over our head, right? Like, you know, and- Every day. And yeah, yeah right. And that praying for wisdom, like I, 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 I push on leader, the leaders I'm working with all the time of like, I can't tell you all the answers. There's nobody who can tell you all the answers. Like yeah. you're in a, you're in the leadership seat because you are helping define the next steps and and move things forward. And so praying for God to give you the wisdom and the insight. I don't know what I would do if I weren't a Christ follower, right? Like I don't mm. know how I would lead well without that assurance of of like He says He'll give us wisdom, right? And so I love Mark Batterson. He recently posted something about the biggest thing we can do as leaders is pray. And I'm probably butchering the way he said it, but that's the way I took it, took away what I took away. Um, but it was just a conviction to me to say, gosh, the best tool we have in our tool belt as leaders is to be praying for that wisdom and discernment. And I think that's what I would encourage leaders that are sensing something unhealthy is praying through that and looking for insight and wisdom and discernment and then maybe a couple of really safe voices who can help you kind of process the right next steps. Um, mm. And like you said, it may just be, gosh, they need permission to um, say that, you know what, it's a hard season. I'm, you know, it, like there's nothing catastrophic, yeah. but it's just yeah. like, I'm tired. There's nothing hidden and, here. It's just yeah. rough. I'm tired. Yeah. And, and maybe it prompts them to get a little more support and they feel like they don't have to carry it on their own either. And what a gift. Or they got a problem with a child or a teenager or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, you know, yeah. Carrie, here's something really practical. Um, I, I've been pretty honest with my team about the last few weeks have been pretty intense. It's been a busy full season of travel and all the things. And, and um, on my call on Monday, my team said, Jen, how are you doing? And I said, you know what? I'm doing a little bit better because the week before in a call, I said, guys, I am on fumes. I'm going to do my best to contribute to this meeting in a meaningful way, but I'm, I'm just going to be real honest with you. I'm really tired right now. So of course on Monday, they asked me that question again. And, um, and in something in there, I shared, you know what's going on? My husband and I are working on a project on, related to his work. It's just kind of hard right now. And so it's, we're having to make some decisions. It's financially a little bit challenging. And like, so honestly, that's weighing on me. That's what's going on behind the scenes is I've got that going on while, you know, we also are just in a really bu busy season of growth for Foresight. But it was them asking the question that gave me space to just go, hey, you know, here's the thing. I mean, I probably wasn't even fully aware of it. Like, but like, because the team asked the question, um, and prompted me to go, you know what? Yeah, here's what's going on. You know, we're just having a lot of hard conversations at home trying to figure out this project that we're in the middle of that isn't going as well as it should, you know? And yep. and that's that's just real life. Like, you know. Well, and that clears the air. Then people go, oh yeah, we've all been there. Great. And yeah. if that's the end of the story, that's the end of the story. That's a good explanation. And that probably won't be there two months from now. Or if yeah. it is, you'll update them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, we talked about unhealthy cultures. What are some signs that your culture is healthy? I want to end this on like a positive <laughs> no, right? note. So, yes. yeah. you know, what are what are some signs? Some people might be like, is, my, is everything toxic? I mean, according to the headlines, everything is these days. I know. But there are some actually really healthy leaders and healthy organizations. So how do you know yeah. that the grass isn't greener on the other side? Yeah, yes. So here's the fun part, right? Like, first of all, there's no perfect culture because we're a bunch of imperfect people trying to do this together. So like- Not first, if I'm leading, it's not perfect, Jenny. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so that's the first thing I'm telling leaders is like, you know, but we want a healthy one. We want, you know, and so defining what that looks like. And I, I said this earlier, but 
just even an understanding of what is culture. You know what? Culture is, I have a couple different definitions, but it's who we are and how we work together to achieve our mission. So are we hyper clear about who we are, that mission, that vision, our purpose? Do we know how we work together? And Carrie, I know you you and your team do this well, but values that guide us, right? Like this is this is how we work together. This is how we show up. This is who we are at our best. This is how we commit to one another. So healthy cultures understand those things. Like they have kind of the ground rules of this is this is how we work together. Like this is this these are our guiding principles. And so healthy cultures understand that and it's super clear. Um and uh you know, I think another thing especially when we're talking churches um, I think one of the things that grieves me the most is when church teams are unhealthy because, you know, it should be the most energizing, most exciting, most passionate place to work because we're serving the greatest mission. Now, and there are, yep. uh, there are, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, what, wherever we are, we can live our mission out. But I mean, church teams ought to be remarkably fun teams to be a part of. Now, it doesn't mean we it's not We should be work. the light to businesses and families. They should go like, excuse me, what, what are you guys doing? What are you because doing? we need more of that in my work. Yeah. And I don't mean, and I know you don't mean this either. I don't mean just like fluffy, warm, kumbaya, like, you know, it's great, everything, you know. No, we actually come and we do really hard work together. We like hold ourselves accountable. We have fun. We, um, we care for each other. We champion each other. We, you know, we say, hey, you know what? You mentioned you were, you said you were going to have this project to me by such and such date. How are you doing on that? Because we know we have a shared mission we're working towards. So it's not without good rigor and accountability. I think actually those are good signs of good healthy cultures when hard conversations happen um, frequently and honestly. Um, and uh, yeah, we just, we really sense that this mission we're on is vitally important and we're all committed to it. In the church world, I say, you know what? Our staff is actually our first congregation right? Like, especially for senior leadership, your staff is your first congregation, like the health of that team, how well they're working together to achieve the mission is directly going to impact the health of the, the church at, at large. And so, um, you know, you get to define what does great culture look like here? That's the fun part, right? Like you can say, this is who we are and how we work together. And once we have clarity around that and we're living into that, it gets really fun. What makes for a good cultural value? You teach on mm. this extensively. I have done some work in this area. We were actually debating with our team just a couple of days ago. One of our values is err on the side of generosity. Mm -hmm. And someone said, you know, I think we're doing a really good job financially being generous to people. Uh, I think we're, we're sort of generous in spirit and tone. But I've noticed that sometimes we're not very generous with our time with each other. It, it feels a little bit rushed. And I thought, you know, that's a great application. Now we can have a conversation about what that means. So I want to make sure that mm -hmm. they get a first claim on my time and we have a first claim. Because you're right. Like, yeah. you know, if you have a bad server who's grumpy at you or flight attendant who's grumpy at you, chances are maybe something happened at home or maybe they just have a bad manager. Like, right, and if that right. is your staff culture, right? If that is your staff culture, where it's not fun, your customer is going to feel that. Like your client, sure. your congregation is going to feel that. So any thoughts on what makes for a good value? The reason I'm asking, yeah. this took me like a year to figure out. For the first time when we did values, maybe 10 or so odd years ago. Yeah, it was about that, maybe 12. Um, it took me a long time to figure out, you know, because you want to say prayer, scripture, excellence, integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, those are all like, okay, yeah, but what else? Yeah, And so we ended up with stuff like air on the side of generosity, surprise and amaze, mm -hmm. uh, pursue health, yep. values like that. What, what yeah. defines it for you? Yeah, I love this question because this is where a lot of leaders get stuck is like, well, there's so many things that should be good values. Um, yeah. Like you were saying earlier, prayer and integrity and, you know, all of that stuff. Well, absolutely. And I don't mean to be dismissive of those things, but in some ways, those are kind of the assumed, depending on the yeah. mission and your know, organization. Stakes, guys. Like, yeah. Like yeah. you're that's yeah. pay to play. You're not here if those things aren't already a given. What we're looking uh -huh. for is like what are the handful of things that are distinctive about your team and the work you do from 
another organization. Like the, they distinctively set you apart. And so you named those as you were sharing some of the, the values that you guys have. And then what I encourage teams to do is we have we have a values grid that tool that we use. And so we say, um, hey, what's the value? Like just at its core, like for us at Foresight, it's self-leadership because um, we mm. really believe that we've got to lead ourselves well to lead others better. And so um, so we have the, that value of self-leadership, but like then saying, one. okay, why? Why that? You know, and so we write a belief statement for that value. Okay, okay. We believe we have to lead ourselves well because if we're going to be pouring into and investing into leaders on a daily basis, if that we're not coming from a healthy place, that could cause more damage than good. And so there's a lot on the line. So that goes back to my conviction around leadership being sacred work. So that's our belief statement. Then we say, okay, what is what are the behaviors? What does that look like in action? So for every value, we'll just define three or four. You know, we're not, it's not this laundry list of behaviors, but three or four distinctives. You know, we're gonna commit to ongoing leadership and development ourselves. So we have a plan, every team member has a plan for their own growth. Um we will uh uh we will we will uh uh, adhere, adhere to our margins and rhythms of life. So back to like my accountability with my team, right? Like that's core to our values that guide who, how we work together. So I'm always encouraging teams, what's that value? Um, what's the belief behind that? And then what does it look like? Like three or four, just kind of like, you know, you're living this value if you see these things. Mm. And then it's a lot of fun if you have a story or a memorable language to put around it. Um, and so, uh, so we encourage teams that's, you know, you're not going to put all of that on the wall when you list your value statements, but that's what you're going to have kind of behind the scenes that kind of give that breadth and depth of the value for you to really, for your team to understand, okay, that's what this really means for us. That's what this looks like. Jenny, this has been such a life-giving, honest conversation. Thank you for being so vulnerable. Um, question for you, anything sure. else that we haven't touched on? that you want to talk about? Now, I think we've hit hopefully some things that are helpful and encouraging. And I would say, gosh, you guys, leading a healthy team is absolutely one of the greatest joys. So even though I had some bumpy seasons, I've had just some wonderful seasons. of, And it probably is what fuels me is having seen both. Having been in some seasons where a team was unhealthy and then like being able to live into and do my best to lead healthy teams. And um, what a gift to be able to help align people around a shared mission, help create an environment and a culture where they feel like they can give their best when they know what's expected of them. Um, they can contribute in a meaningful way. And um, and then they feel like they're part of something that really is significant and matters. Like it's the competitive advantage. Like it, you know, like healthy teams is is truly a competitive advantage in being able to achieve our missions. And so spending disproportionate time and energy into developing your team and developing your culture, I think has far greater ultimate impact um, than just figuring out your next strategy. So if people want to track with you online, where is an easy place to find you these days? Yeah, the best place to like connect with with me and the team is getforesight.com. That's G E T, the number four S I G H T dot com. And uh, we have a fun little like blind spot assessment right there at the top. It's the culture blind spot assessment. And it's a free little tool that helps you kind of assess, hey, where where might we have a few bumps in our culture we're not aware of? Um, lots of free resources, blogs, articles, podcasts, the whole thing to just kind of equip you in that. And then I'm just je at Jenny Catron on all the socials, J-E-N-N-I-C-A-T-R-O-N. So it's, I'd love to connect there as well. Well, Jenny, as always, it's a delight to connect with you. Thank you so much for uh, just being so transparent, for helping so many leaders today. I really appreciate you. Carrie, thank you. Thanks for having the conversations that help us all lead better.